Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to L.A. Noir. Now I've changed a couple of things for this episode. See if you can figure out what they are. Didn't do that though, that's some weird loading bug. Well done, lads. You did well with the Summers case. But we have a problem. The examiner received a new letter today. Do you mind if I take a look, Ray? Go right ahead. They've both been rinsed in gasoline like the previous letters, so I can't lift a print. So, for the record, L.A. Noir has a black and white filter, but that's all it does. I edit the film grain and reduce the audio quality myself. To suffer woes which hope thinks infinite, to forgive wrongs darker than death or night. Figured it sounded more authentic this way. but the killer knew about this message. Another snippet from the Shelley poem. If the note is from the Dahlia maniac, he definitely also killed Teresa Terrell. Mal and I agree. But where does that leave us? If this is the Dahlia killer, and he is responsible for the Tarles and murder, not to mention the Molotovs. Hang on a moment, Skipper. Let me finish, Rusty. We have five birds in hand and none in the bush. The department will not survive a scandal if we have to let them all go without catching a fiend first. Your careers will be over for a start, gentlemen. Looking in wonder... Ah, oh, fuck it. Or yet I knew this rhyme was too good to be on. true. I hid myself within a fountain in the public square. You like that stuff? What is it supposed to mean? It's supposed to... Forget what it's supposed to... What does he want? Where are you going with this, Cole? He's obviously taunting us. He believes he's far more intelligent than we are. Okay. It's some kind of story, right? A guy that God hates chains him up. It's an allegory, Rusty. A what? story with two meanings. A symbolic meaning. But that's what he wants us to think. Could he be using it literally? Within a fountain in a public square? Be that easy. Can somebody tell me what the fuck is going on? The fountain in Pershing Square. Come on, we have a clue. Captain, thanks, Ray. Be careful, Phelps. This is his game you're playing now. Now he sort of stripped off me the grand jury. The reason I chose this episode is because it is easily the most visually dynamic out of all of them. So I figured it would be a good way to show off the effects of black and white. In the game. Need a drink. You can drive. I got the jitters again. Come on, Rusty. With that donut eating ass to good use. All those cases, Rusty. What have I been telling you all along? You gotta get this guy. I know. Enough women have died. Yeah, and it's our asses on the line, too, Phelps. You heard what the captain said. The department is not going to take responsibility for all those bad convictions. Success is a double-edged sword. Let's just get this sick pervert and have it done with. In case it wasn't clear, I'm pretty sure Cole was also worried about his career there. Or at least he was in previous conversations. Rather you than me, Phelps. You know the local hobo used that as a train. Elizabeth Short. Betty Short. Black Dahlia. It's not much of a keepsake, considering the other stuff that have been missing from the crime scenes. So yeah, that's what this mission is. It's a treasure hunt. We, we get these excerpts from a real-life poem. Elizabeth Short social security card. Jesus Christ. That's not all. There's another stanza from Shelley. 
Can you work it out? And then we have to figure out what he means by it. You got a city map? See if you can work out where he's taking us. I don't like this freak leading us around by the nose. A little tutorial in the corner there is telling us. But yes, here's the map. I've never really used it before, but you do need to use it for this mission. There are all of these landmarks around, and one of them is the correct destination. They will all turn into yellow flags, by the way. That's not a giveaway. Although only one of them has that usual sort of introduction to a new location. Only the right location does that. Anyway. You drive. I need to go over the case notes. Elizabeth Short was found dead on January 15th, 1947, and the state of her body actually has little in common with any of the victims in this case. Victims who are, for the most part, based on real-life unsolved 1947 murders. It's really him, the fuck who killed the Dahlia. Can you believe this? He's leading us. It's his game, Rusty. He may want someone to catch him, but he's extremely dangerous. I doubt if he will give up easily. Suits me down to the fucking ground. We clip this fuck and we get citation. <laughs> what a day to be a cop. Depends if push the park will be able to shove the side out. Like, the fact that they're all based on real-life murders is, more than anything, that's the real reason why the killer varies his methods in this case. Anyway, Short's body was found cut cleanly in half, with all of her blood drained out ahead of time, and several pieces of flesh cut away. So you yeah, have very little in common with most of the murders. But... That ceiling there is the answer to the clue. Can I help you, sir? Detectives, LAPD. This is very important, sir. How do we get to the top of the chandelier? You what? Have a little faith, pal. We're in a real hurry. Head up to the top floor. There's an access panel and a ladder in the maintenance room. Hmm, crime scene music started up. Now, if I recall correctly, the best way to reach that maintenance door is down this way. But maybe not. Maybe Rusty knows where he's going. Anyway, something else you can see here, just from that, is that the, uh, the doorways you can go through the the handles are still a different color, even in black and white, so that's not too much of a problem. I'm going out there, Rusty. Better you than me. Be careful. It could be a trap. Not sure how it could be a trap, though. But someone else was here first. That much is clear. Deirdre Muller's missing watch. She was missing her watch and her ring, but we recovered the ring earlier. From the temple's high of man's ear and eye, roofed over sculptures and posy. Where have I seen that? Where science bedews his daedal wings. Christ, hold it off that goddamn thing! Find a rope, Rusty! There isn't time! Get you can swing that thing from side to side. Get over the head, then jump for it. So did the killer cause that to happen? And if so, how? Or is that just, you know, shoddy workmanship? you climb the further you fall let's get out of here another dahlia clue no a yellow gold wristwatch a molar dame yes and a scrap of the poem another location if i can work it out i can indeed work it out 
I need to go to the pause menu to do so. It is, let's see here, yeah, the public library. Now, Deidre Muller had a combative relationship with her husband, Hugo. On the night of the murder, she and Hugo argued over who would pick up their daughter from school, and she stormed out and went to a bar. Something that's uncharacteristic, but not impossible. You know the way. You can drive. He keeps mementos from all his victims. This guy needs to be taken out of circulation. He takes pleasure at stringing us along, demonstrating how much smarter he is. You can enjoy it while it lasts. Got you now, genius. Coming for you. Yep, there's the ear and the eye. There's a bunch of scaffolding out along the outside here. And that's actually what we're going to climb. On a hunch, I guess. I'm pulling rank here, Cole. I'm not hauling myself up there. Let's go get him, Tiger. It'd slow me down anyway, old timer. Anyway. After she went to the bar, she met the killer and started telling him details about herself after having a few drinks. The killer then snuck over to her house while Hugo was out driving and her daughter was still stuck at school, and he stole a spare tire iron and Hugo's jumpsuit from the laundry. Finally, he caught up to Deidre just as she was about to leave the bar, hit her with the tire iron, and then drove her car back to his place for everything else. Yeah, you really need to hold down W and S to keep your balance there. Anyway, once the killer was finished, he dumped the body and abandoned the car at the school where he knew her daughter went. And they are really loving the balance beams on this one. Yeah, this is a very unusual case compared to all of the others. Much more about physical... Ch Sometimes a step backwards is a step in the right direction. <laughs> I, I get the feeling that line was added for the sake of uh, playtesters. I'm almost at the top. How come I have to go back down? It's not always clear. Right, so... Should be around here somewhere. Ah, there it is. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Ripped from Antonia's necklace. There's that last piece of jewelry that was missing. Round which death laughed, sepulchred emblems of dead destruction, ruin within ruin. So this is a treasure hunt. You haven't figured that out yet? Yes, yes it is. It's a silly, elaborate treasure hunt that clearly only exists because this is a video game. What is it this time? The religious medal from the Maldonado case. The Dahlia, Moeller, Maldonado. When this gets out... We still have to find the guy, Rusty. Another poem. Well, you must have some idea, right? Come on, Phelps. We're on a roll here. Don't let me down. All right, what do we got? What do we got? Jammed in the hard black deep. Apparently, before they were called the Labre Tar Pits, it was the Westlake Tar Pits. They got a name change at some point after 1947. Did you read about the trial set in the paper? Hmm. 
Ah, there it is. <laughs> Apparently he does not want to jump over a wall and a hedge. So I've got to go all the way around in order to get into our uh, convertible. Can you drive to this one? We're gonna catch hell for this. Banging up innocent men. The newspapers will crucify the guy. They won't have time to wonder about our mistakes. We'll be okay, Rusty. As long as we catch the guy. I hope you're right, Paul. You're famous if you make this case. Scenic. These are my best shoes, Phelps. I'll leave you to it. Well, looks like your best shoes would have been preserved anyway, but... Yeah, he's definitely gonna make Phelps do it. Very funny. It's actually a pretty simple maze, is what's going on here. So, Antonio Maldonado was serving her husband divorce papers on the night of the murder. Can you see it through the car? So, she went to a bar and started telling everything to the killer and everyone else who would listen. How you doing out there? I'd be doing better if you were the one trying to get across this thing. Since she was drunk and needed a ride, she tried to call a cab from the market across the street. But then the killer showed up in a brown Ford coupe and drove her to her husband's place. Whoa. When she was done, she came back to the Ford, and he then drove off and murdered her. He then spent the rest of the night breaking into a room for her charm bracelet, dropping the incriminating evidence into the office of the market. That's at the forefront of my thinking. And setting up that elaborate crime scene. See, that was easy. And here we are. The white shoe. Of course, it could be blue for all you know. One of Teresa Terrellson's shoes. A sphere which is as many thousand spheres. Okay, where to now? Actually, this is another fairly easy one. Since you would have to have discovered the other landmark on your way here. Assuming you drove, of course. What is it? An open-toed white shoe, and another stands up from the pole. Oh, I really thought that hobo bum did the Terrellson bra. Confessions from the insane aren't the most credible evidence, Rusty. Is this thing over? It's all part of his power over us making us run round all over the city for the crumbs he's leaving. So if we keep this up, we can find the guy? Alright, so like I said, this is actually pretty easy because it's... the answer is right over here. In fact, it's so easy, I'm going to drive. Listening to Duke Ellington on KTI. This guy looks out for women in bars who've had too much to drink, who are emotionally disturbed, need a shoulder to cry on, he plies them with booze, probably offers them a lift home, then beats their brains out and strangles them. Could be any schmo hanging out in the bar. No, not anyone. He displays the bodies, leaves us messages. For all the violence, it's very controlled behavior. 
Straight ahead. Yep, there's the sphere. That's a thousand spheres. I just need to get over to it. On it goes. What do you think we'll reach the end of this thing? But on the night of the murder, Teresa Terrelson wanted to go dancing, but her husband didn't. He dropped her off at their home early that night, and she went out again to her favorite bar without her handbag to find someone who would take her dancing. been in here, Galloway? No. I have no intention of going in. I heard that thing's tricky. I'm gonna wait here and have a quiet smoke. Think about hidden meetings. It really isn't that tricky. There's like one decision you have to make. But after a few more steps I don't need to cover, because the case covered it, she wound up at the Crystal Ballroom where she poured her heart out to the killer. He didn't have much of a plan on this occasion, so he simply stalked her as she left on a bus, murdered her as soon as she got off, scratched cunt BD onto her torso, and then planted what few personal items she had in the nearby hobo camp. Oh yes, and he also kept one of the shoes because she didn't have any jewelry. Belonging to Celine Axford Henry. Thrones, altars, judgment seats, and prisons. No, it couldn't be. That's not a no, it couldn't be referring to the police station, which, after all, is too brazen even for this guy. See? That was easy. I found Celine Henry's ring. How far does this thing go? How did we not catch this nut job? And you're too focused on getting people arrested as fast as possible, that's how. Anyway, the no it couldn't be is referring to the fact that we've already been to this next destination. The Intolerance Set. Thrones and altars. Incidentally, this place was actually torn down by the end of the uh, 1910s. Don't need this. That's that cop. Seems like a decent guy. So let's see. After a typical evening of domestic abuse and violence, you're behind the wheel. Celine Henry went to her favorite bar on the night of the. Did he knock some people over just now? He did! He knocked two people over. Damn. He's leaving us this trail of evidence. Why? Vanity. He wants to see if there's anyone out there smart enough to catch him. He leaves us evidence, but every location is a trap. He's testing us, physically and mentally, to see whether we are worthy. Titan guy. You have to stouse with God. Very good. You thinking about reading some Shelley? <laughs> All that egghead stuff? <laughs> no, I'm sticking to the funny papers and the form guy. You sleep better. I wouldn't exactly say all the places have been traps. Difficult, maybe, but not traps. Through that staircase, it just sort of pointed it pointed the way for you there. So, for Celine Henry, after a typical evening of domestic abuse and violence, 
Celine Henry went to her favorite bar on the night of the murder and told her life story to the killer. She then went out with Alonzo Mendez, and the killer tracked them to Mendez's apartment. Now, at this point, it gets a little sketchy since Mendez refused to talk, but the killer must have gotten her away from him at some point, killed her, and then planted the evidence in Mendez's apartment. He also broke into Celine's house for some unknown reason. Jesus, now look what you did! Hang on, Paul! I'll get you off of there! You can only stand on four spots for this. It's kind of weird. I mean, I, I guess it makes it easier, but it's still weird. You gotta make it to the next platform. Get that thing as close as you can. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. I figured it out. Alright, what we want is not up here. It's actually on the next floor down. on an actual throne. Where's that light coming from? It's not coming from the sky. Ah, there it is. That's the light. That's just curious there. Typewriter ring. Summers. Kind of a massive coincidence that the only murders this guy looks into are those of a serial killer. Place he calls home. End of the line. I mean, not one of these guys have been copycats. Or just unrelated. It's kind of silly, really. Summers, Rusty. The last trophy was her ring. You find another piece of the poem? Yes. The last piece. You sure, Cole? Let's find out. Let's see. Late lamented home where everyone ends up. Well, now. How about a church with a graveyard? might see this as a cry for help. God's sake, Phelps. I'm not trying to justify this. Hear me out, buddy. This guy has been successfully slaughtering women for half a year, maybe longer. He researches and then plants evidence so that we always have someone to go at. If he hadn't sent the letters and the poem, he could have gone on forever. We would have been none the wiser. We would have four executed men on our conscience and have been happy about it. Why else is he doing it? New face of the department, Phelps. The modern cop tries to understand why the perp does what he does. Me, I just drop the hammer down my whole lives. Front a rope and you really don't worry about what it's feeling, just grind it in the paper. Yeah, and in the process you kill a bunch of innocent roaches. So Evelyn Summers was drinking with James Tiernan on the night of the murder. Shut up. When she got to talking about herself while the killer was present, he stalked her to James Tiernan's hotel room and raided for the right moment, which came when she stumbled out of the room and onto the nearby railroad tracks. He then returned to Tiernan's probably unlocked room to plant the evidence, and when Tiernan came to and saw it, he completely freaked out. You know the rest of the story from there. Also, you may have noticed on that gate, one of the posts was missing. A post used to break into Maldonado's apartment room. Also, I am looking for the Brown Fort Coupe, but it's not around. For whatever reason, it's, it just does not exist here. 
guns out. Reminds me of my days as an altar boy. There's a light coming from the house. Nothing hasty, gentlemen. Keep your hands where I can see them, or I'll be forced to redecorate the stucco with your entrails. We're from the LAPD, sir. I'm going to tell you only once to lower your weapon. The LAPD, you say? Is it really possible you could have found me after all this time? How interesting. Put down the gun, shitbird. Last warning. This boorish ignoramus could never have found me. It was you, wasn't it? Do you remember me, detective? The temp bartender. Yes, you found me. From the first case. You know what I'm capable of, and yet you walk in here like lambs dressed for the slaughter. We'll see about that. Things disappeared. Where did he go? Down the tunnel? I can't let the son of a bitch get away. The house, Rusty. There must be another entrance into the house. Don't know why you would assume that, but okay. Anyway, this is me still looking for his car and not finding it. Still, I can take this moment to explain the killer's ambidexterity. The killer is left-handed, but he was taught to use his right hand at school because conformity was this huge thing a hundred years ago. LAPD! Oh, jeez. This is already looking kind of wacky. And then there's this. Ugh. This must have been a place, Rusty. The place he killed the Black Dahlia and carved up Maldonado and collected a bucket's worth of blood. It's the basis for all his riddles. Prometheus defied the cruel gods. This guy thinks he's doing the same thing. Defying gods can be hazardous to your health. Come on. Stupid angle. I hate to think what he's done with this thing. Medical experience, baby. At least some working knowledge of biology. He's cruel and he's methodical. And he doesn't clean up after himself either. I'm not going to go down there just yet, though. There's one more room I didn't look into, and yeah, there's the typewriter. The one with the slightly askew E. It doesn't completely take the ink. Did you notice that about all of the, uh, the clues? E was a little off. It's actually fairly realistic. We're going down there. I'll go. Call for backup and keep an eye out above ground and see where this thing comes out. Don't let me down, Rusty. Reinforcements are on the way. Cease and desist. You're an interesting man, Detective. Why the police force? They obviously don't want it. Do I get a sense you're looking for personal redemption? Do you think we have something in common? Mm -hmm. 
You son of a bitch. Surrender now or I will use deadly force. You killed my hat. This thing has come to an end. You know that. Where's the press, Cap? I think Phelps and I should get a medal for this. This has got to be the case of the year, right? The case of the century, when you think about it. Are you finished? Yes, Skipper. Good. Because there won't be any press briefings or commendations. What are you talking about? We got the werewolf, the guy who killed the Dahlia, killed all the other broads. You got no one. Mason was a ghost. Can you at least tell us why, Captain? Mason is the half-brother of one of the most highly elected officials in this country. How high? Beyond the moon for mere mortals like us, Rusty. There'll be no more mention of him. The city owes you both. But there'll be no mileage in ever bringing this up again. What's going to happen to the suspects in the cases, Captain? I won't be a part of that. A bit of missing evidence at the grand jury. A procedural error here, a mistake there. All be quietly let go. The DA knows how we got to play it. That's it? I'm afraid it is. And I have some news for you, Phelps. No more rooting around in the entrails of cadavers and corpses for you. The head of vice has asked the chief for you. I'm reluctant to see you go to the glory boys of that vice, but my hands are tied. Go home to that lovely wife of yours. Celebrate your I love how the music makes a promotion device sound like a pronouncement of death. Also, like I said, these are based on unsolved murders in 1947. And that little ending there would be... Well, the idea is that that is why they are unsolved murders. Like this is some sort of true history could have happened sort of deal. Breathe out, kid. You'll go purple. I'm scared, Sarge. Everybody's scared, kid. Anyone who says he isn't is a damn liar. How many times have you been in combat, Sarge? I was with Raider Battalion on Peleliu my first time. Was it bad? It's always bad. Will this be bad? As bad as it gets, kid. But you stick by the Marine next to you, and he will stick by you. So, some of the guys, they aren't very friendly, Sarge. They've lost a lot of their friends in the last couple of days, kid. They think if they don't get to know you that they won't have to grieve for you if you get killed. They're wrong. It doesn't work that way. Don't worry. No Marine in this company will let you down. So, for today's episode, I considered covering the Black Dahlia, since that's pretty apropos. But apparently, the movie wasn't nearly as good as L.A. Confidential or the book version, and this series isn't about books. Plus, the movie isn't about a serial killer. So instead, I decided to cover a movie that is about a serial killer. A movie that's just barely within the cutoff date to qualify as a classic film. Psycho. The story about the story. You didn't think we'd get through this series without covering something by the master of suspense, did you? 
Alfred Hitchcock was a man who presented his stories in a variety of mediums and in a variety of communities. He started out directing silent films in the 1920s in the United Kingdom, and he immigrated to Hollywood in 1939. In 1955, he embraced television, creating the show Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which ran for 10 years. By the end of his career, Hitchcock would direct a total of 58 feature-length films on top of many short films and his television efforts. To students of film, Hitchcock is probably best known for the way he advanced cinematography by turning it into a way to subconsciously but deliberately manipulate the audience's emotions. For instance, I saw a video on YouTube recently, links in the description, on how Hitchcock blocked out an entire scene in Vertigo by paying attention to where the actors and the camera are standing. When Jimmy Stewart's character Scotty is in control of the conversation, he's standing while the other character, Gavin Elster, is sitting. When Gavin starts spinning a tale about his wife, he walks onto the raised part of his office in the back as if he's on a stage. And when he's finished and Scotty decides to go along with his plan, he's the one who's sitting while Gavin is standing. Psycho, released in 1960, was based on a novel which was based in turn on a real-life serial killer, and I'll be getting back to that later. Both the studio system and the Hayes Code were in their death throes by this point, but even so, Hitchcock's studio, Paramount, was not looking forward to being associated with a film about a serial killer. As such, Hitchcock made a deal with them. He would be the executive producer, finance most of the film out of his own pocket, he would make the film using his Universal Studio lot and crew, which he had for his TV show, and in exchange, he would be entitled to a majority of the film's profits. Which turned out to be a great decision on his part, since the film turned out to be his most popular by far, and made him a multi-millionaire. Now there's this idea out there that Hitchcock only cast unknown actors, aside from the female lead, Janet Leigh, but that's not actually true. Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates, was an up-and-coming star who had been nominated for an Oscar the previous year, and most of the rest of the cast were character actors with solid records. The film is black and white, pretty rare for a 1960A film, but aside from being an artistic choice, it was probably also an economical one. Black and white film was cheaper than color. I should also spare a few words about the film score. It only uses string instruments, a fact that wasn't true for any other horror film up to that point, and is still rarely seen today. Apparently, the composer, Bernard Herrmann, was inspired by the minimalism of black and white. Hitchcock originally wanted no music for any of the motel scenes, but he changed his mind when he heard the screeching violins Herman had added to the famous shower scene. The film's success was also helped along by Hitchcock's unique marketing strategies. Because of the great big twists, both in the middle and at the end of the film, Hitchcock refused to let his lead actors go on any talk shows to promote the movie. He didn't allow any advanced screenings for critics, and the original trailer was just Hitchcock leading the camera on a six-minute tour of the set and almost but not quite giving away the plot. The biggest thing, though, was that he insisted that no one be allowed into the theater after the film began, which was very much not the policy up to that point. Apparently, Hitchcock was worried that people would feel disappointed if they came in late and never saw the lead actress, but it was also one hell of a gimmick. The cinemas wound up loving the way people lined up to get inside, too, so the policy actually caught on afterwards. The Story As soon as the credits finish, we start with an opening scene that was as much a dare for the censors as it was anything else. Seriously, Hitchcock offered to reshoot the scene with the censors present, and they backed off. We're in a hotel in Phoenix, Arizona with a couple of lovebirds enjoying a long lunch break together, in their underwear. Sam Loomis and Marion Crane are meeting in secret because Sam is up to his eyeballs in debt and alimony payments, and while they are two consenting unmarried adults, it was still somewhat scandalous in 1960 to have extramarital relations, let's say. 
Marion says she'd be alright with living on the bottom rung so long as they could live together, but Sam doesn't want to inflict his poverty on her. When the lunch break ends, they leave the rent-by-the-hour hotel room, and Sam heads off to his home in Fairvale, a non-existent town somewhere east of Los Angeles. Oh hey there, Alfred. Nice to see you're still doing your cameo appearance thing. Marion heads back to the office where she works as an assistant to a real estate agent. Her boss, George Lowry, has just closed a deal with a Texas oil tycoon named Tom Cassidy. Cassidy is a boisterous man who's buying a new home for his daughter as a wedding present. And as a boisterous Texan millionaire, he's decided to buy the $40,000 property in cash. Lowry is rather unimpressed by this, since he prefers a check for such transactions, and he asks Marion to put the cash in their safety deposit box. Immediately. Marion asks to go home once she's done, and Lowry allows it since he'll be busy entertaining Cassidy for the rest of the day. However, Marion can't resist the allure of the cash, not when Cassidy had bragged that he could afford to lose it, not when it could clear her boyfriend's debts and let them marry. So she packs her things and heads for Fairvale. She winds up seeing her boss as she's leaving town, which spooks her a little. When she starts feeling tired, she pulls over on a side road and sleeps in her car. The next morning, a highway patrolman in some very intimidating shades spots her and asks what she's doing there when there are some perfectly good motels in the area and Marion acts so suspiciously that he decides to start following her. She noticed the officer checking her license plate, so after she apparently loses him, she finds a used car dealership and buys a random vehicle with California plates for $700 cash, without any haggling or counteroffers. Meanwhile, the cop has shown up again, and although he doesn't conceal himself and Marion spots him, she completes the sale and drives off. She also uses the stopover to buy a newspaper. Once she's gone, the policeman goes over to speak with a car salesman who is, quite naturally, just as suspicious of her unusual behavior. Back on the road, Marion starts imagining what the officer and salesman said to each other, along with what Lowry and Cassidy are doing now that she's disappeared, which incidentally means that Hitchcock doesn't have to film those scenes. As night falls, a heavy rain starts up. Marion loses track of the road. She winds up at a place called the Bates Motel, so she decides to stop in. She sees no one in the office, but there's a creepy old house on the hill behind the motel, and she sees the figure of a woman passing by one of the upstairs windows. She heads back to her car to honk the horn, and soon enough a man runs out of the house and apologizes for not hearing her pull up in the rain. The man, Norman Bates, explains that the motel gets hardly any visitors since the new highway got built and traffic moved away, but he still likes to keep up the formalities for the few drivers who manage to get lost. Marion signs a fake name in hometown, and Norman gives her cabin number one, which is right next door to the office. He then gives her a quick tour that makes him seem adorably awkward, and for some reason he can't bring himself to say the word bathroom. It's still raining cats and dogs outside, so although there's a diner ten miles away and Fairvale is only five miles further, Norman offers to bring Marion up to the house for sandwiches, and she accepts. While he's away, she conceals the money in her newspaper, and as soon as she's done, she hears Norman's mother shouting at him about loose women through the open window. Moments later, Norman comes down with the sandwiches and a pitcher of water, apologizes for his mother's behavior, and while Marion offers to share the meal in her room, Norman hesitates and suggests they eat in the parlor behind his office instead. As Marion begins her meal, Norman comments that she eats like a bird, and although his parlor is full of stuffed birds, he says he doesn't know much about them. His hobby is taxidermy, but stuffed beasts creep him out, so he only stuffs birds. They then talk about how everyone's stuck in a trap they could never escape from, and then Norman discusses how his father died when he was five. His mother raised him alone after that, but a few years ago she met someone new, and then he died too. When that happened, Mrs. Bates apparently snapped, and now Norman takes care of her. Marion suggests committing her to an institution, but Norman takes great offense to this and insists that his mother is perfectly safe. As the conversation goes on, by the way, Norman steadily goes from adorably awkward 
too creepily awkward. Still, the discussion also allows Marion to realize that she made a stupid mistake, and she resolves to turn around and head back to Phoenix the next morning. She also gives Norman her real name as she leaves. And now things start to get extra creepy. When Marion goes back into her room, Norman pulls a painting off the wall to reveal a peephole, and he watches her undress. He doesn't watch for too long, however, before he heads back up to the house. Meanwhile, Marion writes down some figures as she tries to think how she'll pay back the extra $700, but she soon tears the paper up and flushes it down the toilet, which, incidentally, marks the first time anyone ever flushed a toilet in a Hollywood production. She then climbs into the shower, and a dark figure with braided hair and a dress shows up and stabs her to death. Incidentally, this shorter-than-you-remember sequence demanded 77 camera angles, 7 days of shooting, a set with removable walls so the camera could film at every angle, a special-made extra-large shower head so Hitchcock could get a clean POV shot, moleskin undergarments, a body double for Janet Leigh, and chocolate syrup for the blood-in-the-water effect. Turns out it dissolves more realistically than prop blood. But yeah, halfway into the movie, they kill the protagonist. Nobody ever did that. Nobody does that. But that's what makes it such a twist. Anyway, Norman soon shouts in dismay that his mother killed someone, but after he gets over his initial shock, he's remarkably calm and thorough about cleaning up the crime scene. He mops up the blood, puts Marion's body and her luggage in her car, including the newspaper full of money, and he dumps the vehicle into a swamp that's so thick it's practically a tar pit. A few days pass, and Marion's sister, Lila, who was established earlier in the film, goes to Fairvale to confront Sam, whom she thinks is hiding Marion. However, Sam has no idea about what's happened to her, and he says the same thing to a private investigator, Milton Arbogast, who shows up a few minutes later. Sam is convincingly clueless about the whole thing, so Arbogast decides to check every hotel, motel, and boarding house in town. This eventually leads him all the way out to the Bates Motel, where Norman has not lit the neon sign like he did before, and he talks about not standing on formalities, despite what he said to Marion. Norman says that he never saw Marion, but Arbogast insists on seeing the registry book and identifies Marion's signature thanks to a sample of her handwriting. Norman reluctantly admits that she may have stopped by, and he gets nervous as Arbogast continues to question him. Still, Norman invites Arbogast to come with him as he changes the linens in all twelve cabins. However, as Arbogast steps outside, he notices a figure standing by the same upstairs window as before. When he points her out, Norman says that it's his mother, and when Arbogast suggests that Norman is hiding Marion, he gets offended again. Arbogast insists on speaking with Mrs. Bates, and at this point, Norman demands that he leave. Arbogast drives off and calls Lila to tell him that he's on to something at the Bates Motel, and he sneaks into the house to speak with Mrs. Bates. Unfortunately, as soon as he gets to the top of the stairs, the same killer as before stabs him to death. Three hours pass, and Lila starts to get agitated. Arbogast promised to get back in touch within one hour, but he hasn't. She talks Sam into visiting the motel to see what's going on. But he doesn't encounter anyone, since Norman is out back dumping Arbogast in the swamp. He does notice Mrs. Bates in the window, though. When Sam returns, he and Lila go see Al Chambers, the local deputy sheriff. They explain the situation, and at their insistence, Chambers calls Norman and hears him tell that the detective came by and then went away. When Sam and Lila add that Arbogast probably returned to speak with the mother, Chambers tells them that she's been dead and buried for the past ten years, the only case of murder-suicide in Fairvale history. Meanwhile, Norman now knows more people will be coming, so he hides his mother down in the fruit cellar despite her protestations. The next day, Lila and Sam speak with Chambers again and find out that he's already been up to the base motel, and he didn't see anything while he was there. That's not good enough for Lila, though, so she and Sam pose as a married couple rent a cabin, and start searching the place. They think that Norman murdered Marion for the money, 
And so, when Sam is distracting Norman so Lila can investigate the house, he eventually confronts Norman with this idea, leading to a fight where Sam gets knocked out. Meanwhile, Lila is searching the house from top to bottom, but it's only after Norman races back inside that she thinks to look in the cellar. It's there that she finds Mrs. Bates, or more precisely, where she finds Mrs. Bates' mummified corpse. When she screams, Norman jumps into the room wielding a knife and wearing a dress and wig, but Sam manages to stop him just in time. We cut to later that evening at the courthouse, and a psychiatrist explains what the hell is going on. Norman was incredibly jealous of his mother, so when she found a new lover, he killed them both. The guilt got to him, however, so Norman created a version of his mother inside his own head, one who was just as jealous of his libido as he was of hers. He also stole her corpse and preserved it. The movie ends with the internal monologue of Norman as Mrs. Bates pretending to be helpless and harmless. Final Thoughts Psycho the Book was based on the life and times of Ed Gein, who really wasn't that much of a serial killer. There's no doubt he was disturbed, of course, but he only had two deaths on his record, confirmed or otherwise. Compare that to Jeffrey Dahmer, who killed 17, John Wayne Gacy, 33, or Ted Bundy, who killed at least 30. Even Jack the Ripper is credited with five victims. Instead, most of Ed Gein's victims were already dead. He robbed the fresh graves of nearby cemeteries before they could fill them in with dirt, choosing only female corpses, and he turned the bodies into... everything. Skulls for bedposts. Skulls for bowls. He used preserved human skin for a wastebasket, chair covers, and an entire woman suit Gein used to pretend to be his own mother. Even so, Gein is, in a very real sense, the grandfather of the slasher film. Aside from Psycho, Gein also served as inspiration for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and both films deeply influenced 1978's Halloween considered by many to be the first modern slasher movie and directly responsible for the massive wave of horror films which came out in the 1980s. It's kind of funny how we all seem to be fascinated by the unknowable alien figure that is the serial killer, the slasher. Maybe it's that same uninhibited nature as the renegade, but I doubt it. Very few of us actually want to be killers, even if we sometimes wish that a certain person would die. Plus, it's hard to sympathize with what's often more of a humanoid creature than a real human. Their faces are always hidden or hideous, and if they aren't the stony-faced silent type, then they're reveling in all the death and gore. There's some catharsis in seeing an asshole get what's coming to them, but we also don't want to see the murderer kill everyone and get away with it. Unless that's the twist ending, of course, but then it wouldn't be a twist if we saw it coming. It's not that whole pure versus impure thing, either. In many slasher films, especially the biggest ones, it's not even true that only the pure, virginal protagonists get to live. I mean, there are definitely films out there that follow the formula, but doing so is by no means a guarantee of popularity, so popularity must stem from something else. So what is it? Fear. Why else would you see a horror movie, except to feel fear? So many people have this crazy notion that we don't want to feel all of our emotions, but that's clearly not true. Why would tragedies like Romeo and Juliet be so popular if we didn't want to cry at the end? Why would action movie melodramas like Commando sell so many tickets if we didn't want to hate the villains and revel in their demise? How could a horror movie like Psycho make Hitchcock a millionaire if we didn't want to feel so scared that some of the test audience members swore they saw that chocolate syrup turn red. We all want to feel all of our emotions, and we like it best when we can feel them on our own terms. That's one of the things that fiction, that stories, can provide. 
a way to feel how we want to feel without any of the consequences that normally go with it. Now, this is mostly based on anecdotal evidence, but from what I've seen and heard, the people most attracted to horror movies and other stories are the ones who are the most easily scared. And I think they like these stories because they get to control their emotions rather than the other way around. Thanks for joining me again for today's film review, and I hope you'll join me next time for a movie about Frank Sinatra's substance abuse problem.